Okay, let me get that going. Alrighty, everybody. Um, welcome to our introduction to our local butterflies um, this evening. We are really excited that you are with us. Uh, my name is Stacey Carpool. I'm the executive director with Bucks County Audubon Society. Um, and if you didn't know, we have been celebrating um, July as Butterfly Month. We've had some great programming going on, um, including on this program tonight, as well as the next one on the agenda is actually this Saturday at noon. And this actually is hopefully going to prepare everybody for that because we're going to be doing the North American butterfly count um, on our property in Solberry. And hopefully we're we'll this to us tonight. Um, so that should be lots of fun. So if you have some free time on Saturday at noon um, and want to come out and count butterflies, um, please come out and join us. Um, we would love that. To, uh, we would love to have you. Um, and then to um, wrap up um, Butterfly Month, um, next weekend, next Saturday um, at four o'clock, we are actually going to do a screening of the documentary um, Beauty on the Wing, um, which should be wonderful. We have the, um, the creator and producer of the um, documentary who's going to be joining us to do a little introduction. We'll be able to screen um, the movie on a much higher resolution um, link that she's going to provide for us. Um, and then we'll be able to as well. Um, so we're really excited about that. So that is ne next Saturday, um, the 20, 31st at four o'clock. Um, and you can register for that um, to get the link as well um, on our website. So, so lots of great things going on. Hopefully everyone's having a great summer. Um, if you haven't had a chance to come out, definitely come out, walk the property. Um, it's beautiful this time of year, a little warm on some days, um, but lots going on, very active, um, active things happening. So definitely come out, enjoy the property. Um, and then don't forget about us. Once school starts, um, we're still a fun place to come and, and do things as well. Alrighty, um, I am now going to turn it over to Diane Smith, who's our Director of Education, um, and let her give you um, a great introduction to all of the wonderful butterflies of our area. I could just ask everybody if you would mute yourself, um, and then um, Diane, you can take it away. All right, well, thanks everyone for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, so this Saturday is the official North American butterfly count um, for our particular area. Um, it's run out of Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve, and they, uh, they, one of their volunteers does just a wonderful job every year. Um, the North American Butterfly Count is one of our um, community science projects, citizen science projects that provides a lot of data to the scientists that study these, these beautiful pollinators. Um, it's been going on since 1993, um, and the US, Canada, and Mexico all participate. And of course, the, rep the reports and the data that we provide um, give the scientists a tremendous amount of information regarding the geographical distribution and relative population sizes of the species that we get to count. So since it's been going on for, since 1993, um, we can now start to really look at if, if there are any trends going across years, any changes to butterfly populations, and accordingly be able to study um, the effects of weather and, and habitat modifications um, across the North American butterflies. So I'm going to um, share my screen. I have a um, PowerPoint presentation for you guys. Um, it'll help us get ready to um, do our work on Saturday. And um, if you have questions during, um, during the show, please put them in the chat. I have a second screen going that's I'm going to monitor and hopefully um, be able to keep up with the chat if not if we miss if I miss anything during I will just get back to it later all right so a couple of beautiful butterflies right on my title screen um, just just for just kind of have you have a look so will a real butterfly please stand up we have a lot of beautiful winged creatures um, that um, we see flying from flower to flower. Um, and everybody says, oh, well, the butterflies are the pretty ones and the moths are the dull ones. So here's a little quiz. Um, which ones of these are moths and which ones of these are butterflies? You can go ahead and put them in the chat if you want. I'll give you a couple of seconds to do that before I give you guys the answers. How do you put something in the chat, Ron? If you go down to the bottom of your screen, um, just run your cursor over. There should be a little, I think it's a green box that says chat. Click on that and a little sidebar will open up to the side and you should be able to type into that and then just hit enter when you're done typing and it should show up. 
Does that work for you? Mm, no. Just put the number. If you did, you get the green chat box. Yes, I did. Okay, so yeah, then just put the numbers in in the in the box, and then hit enter. There you go. All right, so we have um, two is a butterfly. Two and three are butterflies. We think two for a butterfly. Two and three. Okay. All right. So so far, you guys are doing well. <laughs> the um, the first one, number one, is a luna moth. Gorgeous, gorgeous, beautiful moth. Um, interesting fact about the luna moth is it doesn't eat when it's in its adult stage. It has no mouth. Number two is a butterfly. It's a cabbage white butterfly. Number three is also a butterfly. It's a buckeye. We, had, we do have these here. And uh, they're, they're actually really pretty um, if you like those kind of earth tones. And then number four, Four is an IO moth. They're really quite large, um, about the size of the, the palm of your hand um, with those, those brilliant colors. And one of, the, uh, one of the ways you can tell the difference, if you look closely, as I don't know how good the definition is on your screen, but you'll notice that one and three, if you look at their antenna, they're kind of feathery looking. And that's one of the ways that you can distinguish between butterflies and moths. So just a few um, butterfly facts. Um, across the world, there are some 24,000 species of butterflies. Here in the Delaware Valley, there are 45 or so that are common. Um, butterflies taste with their feet, and they do that to determine if the plant that they're on is going to be suitable for them to lay their eggs. Butterflies also have fa fairly good color vision. Um, they can see red and green and yellow. So worldwide, 24,000 species of moths, but worldwide there are over 160,000 species of moths. So 45,000 for 24, excuse me, 24,000 for butterflies and 160,000 for moths. So there's a lot more moths. Um, and they're usually are generally um, pretty nocturnal. All right, let's talk about, um, there's that one, there's a, some, some characteristics of butterflies. There's the one I was telling you about, the uh, antenna. With butterflies, they're usually pretty straight and have a little ball at the end. Moths are feathery. Another good way to tell, although it's not 100%, is when moths land, they generally land with their wings open. Um, if any of you have ever tried to take pictures of butterflies, um, it can get pretty frustrating because when they land on a butterfly, they tend to close their wings up. And so those beautiful colors that are on the back of their wings don't show. Um, so you have to try and get them, you know, when they're kind of sort of more or less in action. Butterflies are active in the day, um, moths are active at night, and then their pupil stage um, is a chrysalis for a butterfly and a cocoon or even underground for a moth. Okay, so we classify butterflies into a number of different families. Um, the swallowtails, uh, many of you have probably seen those large yellow and black butterflies. Um, that's one of our more common swallowtails that we see quite frequently. That's the Eastern tiger swallowtail. Um, we have the cabbage whites and also the sulfurs. Um, there's clouded sulfurs. They look a lot like cabbage whites, but they're yellow. Um, then the smaller butterflies are coppers, hair streaks, and blues. Um, there are quite a number of those we see. Um, brushfoots, hackberry butterflies, satyr and wood nymphs, and then the milkweed butterflies. Um, I'm oh, sorry. Yes. And then the milkweed butterflies would be um, like the monarchs. So here's a typical life cycle um, for the painted butterfly. Paint, painted lady butterflies are one of the butterflies that are very easy to grow indoors. We do a lot of um, projects with kids with painted ladies. They are native here. Um, we usually get the, uh, the eggs from a scientific supply house, um, they're very small, um, about the size of a, a pinhead. It hatches and then the larva or the caterpillar as we're used to calling them, um, eat and eat and eat and eat and grow a tremendous amount. Um, they go through a number of different stages um, that in most insects are called instars. 
where they just grow bigger and bigger and in the process they, sh they shed their exoskeleton several times. Once it's big enough, the caterpillar then will attach itself to um, a stick, a wall, a piece of plant, generally hanging upside down um, so that it's head down and makes a, a little J shape and then forms an outer shell around itself, which creates the pupa or the chrysalis. Within that chrysalis, um, that's where the magic happens, if you will. Um, there's a whole lot of rearranging going on, a whole lot of dissolving of parts of bodies and creating new parts of bodies. Um, and it's, uh, it's really just kind of miraculous what goes on inside the chrysalis. Um, and then, of course, once it's ready, it'll come, the adult will climb out of the chrysalis. And this is probably the point at which the butterfly is most vulnerable to predation because their wings are wet. They're not very strong yet, and they have to pump them full of fluid, get them to dry out before they can fly away. So it's quite, um, it's quite a vulnerable time for a butterfly in their life cycle. The adults live for a pretty short period of time. Um, they have no chewing mouth parts. They can only drink. Um, they have a, a straw-like proboscis where they can sip nectar. And the main purpose of the adult form of the butterfly is to find a mate and lay eggs and start the cycle all over again. So on the right side of the screen, you can see the various body parts of the butterfly, the antenna, um, the proboscis. Just like all insects, they have three body parts, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen, and six legs. And then the color comes from these little um, scales, if you will, that are on the wings. Those scales are very um, important for butterflies' flight patterns. So, you know, when the kids that come to us, they always want to try and catch butterflies with their hands. And, you know, we have to tell them it's not a good idea to do that because you can start rubbing those, those colorful scales off their wing and then the butterfly isn't going to be able to fly very well. So if you, if you do want to catch butterflies, use a butterfly net. Um, they're soft, they, uh, they won't harm the butterfly, and then you can transfer your butterfly to a container and you can have a look at it and then let it go and let it be on its merry way. So here are, are some swallowtails. Um, these can be a little challenging to, uh, to distinguish amongst them other than the Eastern tiger swallowtail. So starting in the upper left, that is a black swallowtail. Um, down below is the Eastern tiger swallowtail. Then going back up to the upper right, that is also an Eastern tiger swallowtail, but it's in the black phase. So it gets a little bit confusing um, because we have the two different colors for um, the Eastern tiger swallowtail. It'll, only the um, females will have this black phase. And then the one in the lower right is um, spice bush swallowtail. Um, that kind of gives you a little clue as to where you might find these butterflies because the spice bush is their preferred food source for their, um, for their larva. So that's where you will find their eggs and that's where you'll find their caterpillars um, eating as they grow. So these are fairly large butterflies. They're four, maybe four and a half inches across wingtip to wingtip. So they're one of the more spectacular butterflies that we'll see you know, during, our, during our walk around on Saturday. Um, I have been seeing quite a number of Eastern tiger swallowtails, the yellow ones um, at, the, at the Audubon this week. So I'm hopeful that if the weather stays good and it's a nice warm day and not too windy, we'll be able to see quite a number of these lovely butterflies. So the other thing that we count when we're counting these butterflies is we don't just count the adults. We also will look for eggs and for larva. So this particular fellow is um, the black swallowtail caterpillar. It's, uh, it's got an interesting set of antenna in the front, um, nice bright colors, sometimes confused with a monarch caterpillar because they do have the same colors. But when we get to the monarch, you'll see that the patterning is quite a bit different. OK, so here's your swallowtail life cycle. Um, you can see on the upper left, you've got the, um, the egg. Generally speaking, most butterflies will lay their eggs on the underside of the leaf. Um, 
It's a little bit of a protection from any kind of predators, gets them out of the really harshest part of the sun. Um, then the egg will hatch and this small, um, almost looks like a piece of bird excrement will be on the leaf and start chewing its way through. So then as it grows, it eventually takes the form that you see on the bottom left. So it's a little bit different than the black swallowtail. This is the Eastern tiger swallowtail caterpillar. Um, it has a set of markings on its, on its hindquarters that look like eyes that kind of is intended to um, confuse a predator. And then when it's ready, it will form its chrysalis, which you see on the bottom right, um, which looks like a dead leaf, really. And that's another um, camouflage sort of protection for the pupa as it's undergoing its metamorphosis. Whites and sulfurs, we have got quite a few of. Um, the, the cabbage whites that you see that's on the left, um, the clouded sulfur and the orange are the, um, the ones that we normally have in quite abundance. These are um, on some, looks like aster plants. Um, the one on the upper left looks like it might be on, gosh, it looks like possibly daisy fleabane. Um, so they're smaller, they're considerably smaller, um, only, you know, maybe an inch or so. All right. So here's your cabbage white life cycle. Um, it's got the eggs are almost, egg, oh, the eggs are almost egg shaped, right? They have, they have a sort of a little point and they're, um, they, they're laid sort of vertically and they all are laid in these clumps um, so that you'll see a number of these, you know, on the underside of a leaf. Their caterpillar looks almost like an inchworm, but if you have to take a close look, you'll see that it's got that light yellow streak down its length. And then again, the chrysalis is um, certainly an interesting um, creature because it looks sort of like, again, sort of like a dead leaf. Okay, so we should see quite a number of these on Saturday. Interestingly, the um, cabbage white butterflies have got little black specks on them, so on their wings. So the female has got two spots and the male only has one spot. So you can actually tell the difference in the gender of your butterflies um, when you have a look at the spots on their wings. Okay, these are some of the most smaller and yet quite beautiful um, butterflies. These are the coppers, hair streaks, and blues. They're small. They're only about an inch to an inch and a, inch and a half. Um, and they're plants that they like to live on. The nectar plants that the adult will use are things like zinnias, um, butterfly milkweed, butterfly weed. Um, they also like clover and buttercups. Um, and then their host plants where they will lay their eggs are things like curly dock and sorrel and those sort of lower growing wide leaved plants um, that are in that particular family. So we can look for you know, eggs and larvae on those kinds of plants. Here's a, a few more of them. There are um, the gray hair streak on the left. And um, actually they're both gray, gray hair streaks. There's the, there's the difference that you see between the wings open and the wings closed. So again, their nectar plants, um, again, Queen Anne's lace, uh, milkweed, swamp milkweed, butterfly milkweed. Um, they also like dogbane, which is um, also in the sort of milkweed family. They have that, it has that same sort of milky sap. Um, and that's where they will get their nectar as adults. The host plants where they, where they will lay their eggs are things like hibiscus and hollyhock, um, passion flower they like as well, and the vetches. So I know people don't they think very kindly of the crown vetches that were planted all along the highway, but it is a, uh, a host plant for these, these lovely butterflies. Okay, a few more that are in the copper hair streak and blue family. All right, then we have the brushfoots. Um, this is um, the morning cloak. 
This is the first butterfly to be seen in the spring. They often come out even when there's still snow on the ground because they hibernate as the adult form. Most butterflies do not hibernate as adults. Um, they'll overwinter either as um, larva or as pupa. Um, and they like um, black alder, willow, ironwood, um, even elm of which we don't have too many anymore, um, but that's their host plants. Um, and these guys will drink tree sap. When they come out in the spring, um, usually about the same time that maple sugaring is going on, um, there aren't that many flowers in bloom, so there's not that much nectar for them to get from flowers, but they will, um, they will drink tree sap. So here is the morning cloak life cycle. Um, they lay their eggs on a, a twig, um, almost as a bracelet around the twig. Um, and when their larvae emerge, um, there's quite a bit of activity because there's so many eggs that hatch generally at the same time. Sometimes their larvae are confused with um, caterpillars that we're not very fond of, like gypsy moth caterpillars. They're somewhat similar in appearance. Um, but all I can say about that is, you know, don't harm insects without a positive ID uh, because you could be um, hurting a, a butterfly rather than a, a noxious moth. So their chrysalis again um, has that dead leaf look. They generally attach to a horizontal type stick. And again, it looks a lot like a, um, a dead leaf. One of their favorite camouflage activities. Okay, some brush foots. Um, now there's some more brush foots. These, this one, gosh, I have a little trouble identifying this one. Hmm. <laughs> Pretty sure, yes, that is a variegated fritillary. Um, that's a pretty large butterfly. That's about two inches. Um, caterpillar hosts for that one are all sorts of different kinds of plants, including May apples that we see, you know, regularly in the spring. Um, those are one of the spring ephemerals that we have. Um, they like violets. Um, they like stone crops, the sedum plants. Um, and those are all good for the, for the plant, plants that they lay their eggs on for their caterpillars to eat. Um, for the adults, um, again, the nectar that they like comes from dog bane. Even um, peppermint, clover, um, tick seed sunflowers, they will drink from as well. So quite a variety of food for the adult. Um, but again, you're looking at a, a smaller population of plants for the, for the caterpillars to eat on. So as we go through this, you'll, you'll notice that I'm mentioning the host plant, which is what the caterpillars need to live on. A lot of people, um, you know, they get very upset when they've got their gardens growing and then their leaves on their plants are starting to get chewed up. Um, but we don't have butterflies without the caterpillars and the caterpillars need to eat the leaves. So I always tell folks, plant extra, plant, you know, some for the butterflies and some for you. Um, some of the, the plants that, you know, that grow in your garden, things like, you know, parsley, um, carrot tops, there are um, caterpillars that love to eat that sort of thing. So I always encourage folks to just plant a little bit extra um, so that you can support the, the butterflies as well as your own, your own garden. Here again, we've got the life cycle of the fritillary. Um, I don't, didn't have a good picture of the eggs, unfortunately, but you can see that the caterpillar is quite distinctive looking. It's got those, um, those beautiful stripes, kind of um, rust color and a pale green, and then it's got spikes coming out of it. Um, there's a lot of different caterpillars that have that sort of um, spiked appearance. Um, I always recommend that people not handle them because, you know, that spiky thing can cause a, a fair bit of skin irritation. So look at it, enjoy it, um, don't pick it up. So then in the lower left, you'll see it's becoming into its J shape preparatory to making its chrysalis. And then the chrysalis is, uh, it's fairly distinctive looking. It's kind of milky white with the uh, brick colored stripes around it. Um, I've not had the good fortune of seeing one of these chrysalises, um, but it is a very interesting uh, characteristic. 
Okay, more yet more brushfoots. There's your buckeye. Um, their egg is a, a dome shaped um, sort of apple green color. Um, it's very small. Again, these are these eggs are really just like the head of a pin. Um, so you need to be looking for very, very small um, eggs. Interesting, again, interesting caterpillar with the, the brushes that come out of its sides and then the chrysalis um, on, its, on its leaf, looks like a leaf stem that uh, it's on. All right. Yet more brushfoots. This is a gorgeous butterfly. This is the red spotted purple. You can see where it has its wings open. It's got sort of a purplish tint on the four wings. And then when the wings are closed, you can see the red spots. We do have these around as well. I'm sorry, I don't have a good handle on what their um, particular um, food plants are. This is a red admiral. Um, this is not a very big butterfly. This one is only maybe two inches or so, maybe two and a half. Um, this uh, butterfly likes plants for host plants that are in the metal family, um, including stinging metal, um, tall wild metal, wood metal. Um, it also will chow down on hops. So people that are growing hops for brewing are not particularly happy to see these guys around. Um, again, just plant extra. So you can see the caterpillar at our right. Again, it's very fuzzy looking. It's got a lot of spikes attached to it. Um, sort of a kind of, a, it doesn't really have a caterpillar type shape. It is, it's more misshapen, if you will. It's, a, it's kind of an odd looking fellow. But for the, for the adults, for the butterflies, um, the sap that they like, um, again, they like tree sap. They also can be found on fermenting fruit. So if you've got fruit trees um, where the fruit has dropped on the ground and is starting to ferment, you might find some of these red admirals there. Um, and they generally only will visit flowers when those two things, the tree sap and the fermenting fruit are not particularly available. If they have to go to flowers, um, they will visit milkweed and clover, particularly red clover, um, as well as asters. These are the hackberry butterflies. Um, again, not very dramatic looking, um, but they can all, they're also sometimes called clovers. Uh, um, so they have a number of different types. Let's see if we don't, we don't have another picture of those. So I thought I had a different picture of those, sorry. Um, they will, have a green chrysalis. I don't have life cycle pictures of them, but they like hackberry trees. Okay, so hackberry butterflies on a hackberry tree makes sense. Um, the adults tend to stay with the hackberries. They they found they're found on the foliage um, and flowers that are near their host plants. They rest on the ground. They will also feed on sap if the tree is wounded. Um, if sap is coming out of a tree wound, they will feed on that. Um, these butterflies overwinter as eggs. Um, so one of the things to, to keep in mind as you're doing your fall cleanup is to not be terribly clean um, because you've got a lot of overwintering um, creatures both in the egg stage and in the larval stage that are using your leaf litter, that are, are using the, um, the dead plants um, that can be left there for, over the course of the winter as their protection so that they can hibernate in that safe zone and then um, come out in the spring. Satyrs and wood nymphs. Um, again, not very dramatic in terms of the colors. Um, some people will see there and say, oh, that's a moth. Um, not this one in particular is a little wood satire, satyr. Um, it's got, again, those, those circles are, are considered false eyes to try and distract a predator or even to make it look bigger so that the predator isn't going to want to eat it. Um, this is the common wood nymph. We have quite a number of these. Again, you see the, the big eye spots. Um, generally speaking, they um, will breed between late May to October. Um, they're small, only about two inches. Um, these host, have host plants 
of um, mostly grasses. They like um, purple top grass, um, little blue stem, and so on. And the adults, again, they like um, rotting fruit. So you'll find, you know, as fruit drops to the ground and starts to decompose, you'll find these particular butterflies um, in the adult stage eating on those. Their preferred habitats are, you know, large, sunny, grassy areas because their young are, are grass eaters. Um, so we have prairies and meadows, even some bogs um, will be home to their, to their larva. And now we get to everyone's favorite, the milkweed butterflies. So monarchs are certainly a, um, a dramatic species. Um, and you can see, um, as I mentioned before, that the coloration with the yellow and black and white is somewhat similar to the swallowtail, but it has a, certainly a different pattern. Um, so monarch butterflies are, are quite famous um, for their migration. I know that we'll, we'll hear more about monarch migration um, next, next week, um, but that's one of the the great stories uh, you know, of animal migration that this small creature can go so far um, between its summer home and its wintering grounds. Um, it's really quite remarkable. Um, they spend, um, oh, here's a, this is one of, the, one of the distinguishing characteristics between male and female is the spot on the hind wing. If you take a close look at the picture of the male, you'll see that there's a small black spot on either side if that the female does not have. So um, that is how you can determine the gender of a monarch butterfly. One of the, uh, the lookalikes for a monarch butterfly would be the viceroy. Um, they're easy to distinguish once you know what you're looking for, but viceroys have done um, a great job of pretending to be monarchs because predators, particularly birds, have found that monarchs don't taste good. Um, so that orange and black coloration um, has been shown to birds to be stay away. It's not something good to eat. And the Viceroy has um, kind of adapted that same sort of coloration um, to pretend to be a monarch. Um, the reason that monarchs don't taste good to birds is because of their food. The milkweed that they eat um, when they're caterpillars has got a lot of oxalic acid in it. Um, which makes them very unpalatable um, as caterpillars, and that carries over into the adult body as well. So birds have learned that monarchs are not particularly um, good to eat, so stay away with that orange color. Here is the um, life cycle. So there's your caterpillar. Um, the new chrysalis is opaque and green. Looks like it has a little um, necklace of gold around the top edge of it. But when the adult is ready to emerge, the chrysalis becomes practically transparent. And you can start to see the colors you know, through the side of the chrysalis with the, the black edges and the bright orange wing. We successfully um, raised a number of monarchs at Audubon two summers ago um, when we found quite a number of them you know, eating the milkweed that we have planted for them and wanting to be part of a monarch tagging process um, that was being run um, by some folks down in the lower part of the county. Um, they gave us a, a bunch of tags. So we raised our monarchs in our little butterfly pavilion. And when they emerged from the chrysalis, um, we put a very small little tag on them and sent them on their way. Um, it was quite a, quite a fun thing to do. Um, the kids really got a kick out of watching them eat all the milkweed and then become chrysalids. Um, and the adults enjoyed it too, not just the kids. So here's the example that I was telling you about of the Viceroy. So if you look at the Viceroy on the left, you can see that the hind wing in particular has got a different pattern to it than the, um, than the monarch. If you notice, there's a, um, sort of a bar, if you will, um, above the spots on the bottom of the hind wing. And that's one of the ways that you can distinguish um, in flight in particular between a viceroy and a monarch. So here is um, just a little graphic of the, the monarch migration. Um, quite a number of them spend 
their hibernating time in Mexico, um, in Central America, even in some parts of um, Southern California where it's warm all year. Um, if the monarch butterflies are in the west of the Rocky Mountains, then they generally hibernate in and around the Pacific Grove, California in eucalyptus trees. Um, if they're east of there, that's when they're the ones that will be going down to Mexico. Um, interestingly, monarch butterflies use the very same tree, not just the grove, but the very same tree um, every year. And that is odd because it's not the same butterfly. So it's really quite a mystery as to how what is probably the fourth generation or so from the butterfly that wintered there last year, how they would know to go to that exact same tree is, is quite a mystery. And scientists continue to study that um, and they have not quite got to the answer yet. Um, their migration can be as long as 2,500 miles away. Um, and so, you know, like most um, creatures that migrate, they migrate for a number of reasons. Um, they can't take the freezing weather and the larval food plants don't grow in their winter overing food sites. So the spring generation has to fly back north to the places where those plants are plentiful. So um, there are a number of citizen science projects that um, do track butterfly migrations. Um, Monarch Watch is one of them where you can actually um, help keep track of the uh, monarch migration as it goes back and forth. One of the particular um, adaptations that they have for being able to do this migration is that um, the fat that is stored, stored in their abdomen is a critical element of their survival. So it fuels their flight, can be you know, anywhere from one to 3,000 miles, but has to last all the way through the next spring. So as they migrate southwards, monarchs will stop, they'll drink nectar, and they gain weight during their trip. So there's, a, there's quite an Im important um, aspect of this that in terms of the people that live in the south providing, you know, nectaring places, places for the monarchs to overstop on their way south so that they can refuel and keep, get those fat reserves up so that they can survive the winter. Um, even though they're gonna be in a warm climate, the food that is not particularly there for them to be able to, to gain any weight and do anything. So um, interestingly, <laughs> they can actually gain weight on their, on their way south, which is interesting. But the other thing that they have learned to do is that they have been able to take advantage of certain air currents as they go south. So um, they have to be meteorologists as well. So they have to watch the weather and check to when for when the air currents are going to be favorable for this southward trip. Certainly don't want to get caught in a Gulf of Mexico hurricane or anything like that. So that's a uh, it's really miraculous what these what these small animals can do in terms of their their flight. Um, all right. So some help for monarchs, monarch way stations. Um, you can participate with the Monarch Butterfly Sanctuary Foundation. Plant milkweed, plant lots and lots of milkweed. All the different types of milkweed will help. Swamp milkweed, common milkweed, um, butterfly weed, um, all the Asclepias are, are very useful to monarchs in their, in their journey. All right, and I think that's it. Yes, all right, let me stop the share. All right, so questions, comments. Um, okay, let me go see what's in the chat. All right, so. Okay, so um, on Saturday, what we'll do um, is we'll meet at the visitor center at noon. Um, if you have binoculars, it's a good idea to bring them. I do have some binoculars that I can lend as well. Um, but it's actually, you know, butterflies through binoculars um, is quite a fun way to watch them. You don't have to quite get so close. Um, you can track their movement um, and it's helpful to be able to identify them by being able to see, you know, all the, the details on their wings. So um, butterflies, are, um, butterflies are easily seen with binoculars and it's a good way to keep an eye on what they're up to. All right, so we'll meet at noon. Um, we'll walk, depending on the 
the weather and how much luck we're having will go for at least an hour, maybe more. Um, and we'll count as many butterflies as we can find. And then we'll report it up to the North American butterfly count. Um, and then the scientists can have our data. All right, questions, comments? I had a good question. Go um, how, how long have you been doing the count? Me personally, I've been doing the count for six years. Wow, well, what's the best number, largest population or numbers of butterflies you saw at one time? Uh, the highest number of butterflies, you mean total count? Total count. Uh, total count. I'm going to say, I don't know the exact number, but it was maybe like 120. Oh, wow. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, it was quite a lot. It was a good year. It was a good year. One year, I found one. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. That was, that, was not, that was not a good year. Was that, was, that, was, that was the year that the gentleman that was farming our ag fields decided to grow corn instead of hay. Oh, no. And he treated the fields with chemicals oh, no. and yes it was it was not good um he doesn't he doesn't farm there anymore <laughs> thank goodness yes Carmesville farm foundation now is managing those fields for us and um it's quite a, a quite a different scenario now um so hopefully um you know we'll see we'll see quite a few the typical count for us you know, when we when we're having a good year and it's not raining, it's not cold, and there's no chemicals around, is in the fifty to sixty range, okay, good. which is which is still quite exciting to see that many butterflies. You don't realize how many of them there are until you actually start looking and counting. It's kind of like going on a bird walk. You, you always hear the birds, but until you stop and look and identify them and count them, you don't realize how many that you're actually seeing. So it's the same with butterflies. What what do you usually see? What's the most common butterfly on Bucks Audubon? Oh, the cabbage white by far. Cabbage whites are, you know, there's there's hundreds of them. Um, after that, the sulfurs are pretty popular. And then then um, the smaller butterflies like the commas and the question marks, um, we see quite a few of those. Um, always, almost always see some admirals, always see a fair number of swag, Eastern tiger swallowtails. I think the reason for that is their host plant is tulip poplars. And we have quite a number of tulip poplars, you know, especially, especially right around the visitor center. Um, so we do see quite a few of those. Um, we also generally see some of the small blue ones, like the summer azures and the, uh, those, got, those ones. Have to be you know, on the lookout for those because they're so tiny. Um, but we do, we do see quite a number of those. We'll often see them, one of the good places to look is to go down into the marshy area um, by the pond, because on those, some of those some of those mud flats, you'll get to see them what they, what we call puddling. Mm -hmm. So the butterflies will go down to this muddy area, to this damp area, and um, get mineral nutrients out of the mud, um, which they need. So a lot of times you'll see them congregating there, and that is something that you can do for butterflies in your own yard is to is to make them a little place to to puddle in. Um, just one small little mud, muddy area where you can keep it damp. Um, if it's in the sun, it's particularly it'll be attractive to butterflies. Thank you. I can't wait for Saturday. I'm looking forward to it as well. The weather should be good. So I've been watching the weather, and it should be should be quite good. Excellent. Anybody else have a question? You can unmute yourself and chime in. You know, there's not that many of us. We can be informal. All right. Well, then I will bid you all to have a lovely evening. Um, and thank you once again for coming. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all on Saturday. Bye. Thanks, Diane. Great job as always.